the words of Reverend Joan Johnson Lewis. As we light our candles this week, we imagine the lights that shine within each of us. We each have intention, we each have experience, we each have thoughts, we each have feelings, we each So please, everyone, rise in body or spirit. Uh, we will be singing hymn number six, Sing of Living. Director of Religious Education for the Time for All Ages. And I believe she will welcome, we will welcome anyone young in body or young in attitude uh, to come up and sit with Miss Sandy. You can sit in the chairs here, you can sit on the stage, or you can sit in the chair you're already sitting in. Here, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, oh. Is that, oh, wow. Thank you. Good morning. January is here. And you gonna sit in my lap? No. January, um, we are focused on finding your center, which I like to think of as <clears throat> figuring out who you are and what you value, which is coincidentally something that UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, is kind of figuring out right now as they study their principles, our principles and resources, sources, sources. Um, and some of you know that today my dad is having a birthday He's turning 91 years old. And he's a guy, in my opinion, who knows his center, has known it for a long time. Um, at 91, he's kind of at the end of his life. We're not talking about him today um, <clears throat> in that respect. Uh, but since he's near the end of his life, like today, when people get near the end of their life, there's this thing that people write called an obituary, which tells people who didn't know them about their lives, right? That's kind of what the adults are going to be doing today, talking about several people 
talking about stuff that you might be able to find in their obituary, which is just like a story about a person um, generally after they've died. Um, my dad got a head start on this, even though he's still living, because he's got lots of information in his own Wikipedia page. Woohoo! Um, so, my dad is having a birthday today. So, we're going to go back and we're going to celebrate my dad's birthday today in RE. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, so, here's the thing when you have an obituary, you learn about a person who's already gone. But our oldest daughter, her name is Allison, when she was in college, she worked in what's called an elder care facility. And she discovered that when a person died, she would read their obituary after having cared for them for a long time. And she was kind of sad that she didn't know all that information about that person before they died. So my dad kind of got a head start. He's got some information already out there about him. So I found a book to read, one of my favorite books. Um, and it's called Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. And it has lots of stories about women, young girls, old girls, women. Um, and some of them have died, and so it's more like an obituary, but some of them are not. So I'm going to read a page about someone we should all know about before they die. This is one of my favorite books, but this particular book is not my book because apparently I've loaned my book to someone, and I got this one from the library, which has a lot of other awesome books, so you can get this from the library too. This story is about Anne Makasinski. This is an illustration of her. Can you see? Once there was a girl who couldn't study when it was dark because her house didn't have electricity. One day her friend Anne was great at building things and she was especially passionate about transistors, devices that regulate the flow of electricity current. What if I could invent a flashlight that is powered by your body? Anne asked her friend. After all, our bodies give off lots of energy in the form of heat. The girls got very excited. Just think how many people could have electricity if this worked. Anne was just 15 years old, but she already had a lot of experience taking things apart and putting them back together. So she started to work on this mysterious new flashlight. She called it the hollow flashlight because she built it using a hollow aluminum tube. When she presented it to the Google Science Fair, she won first prize. It's the first flashlight that doesn't need batteries, wind, or sun, just body heat. Today, Anne is considered one of the most promising inventors of our time. Her dream is to make hollow flashlights available for free to everyone in the world who can't afford electricity. She says, I like the idea of using technology to make the world a better place and to keep our environment clean. And then her other quote is in this book, if you are alive, you produce some light. Mm. Lots of kinds of light, I'm sure. There's uh, 99 other stories in here about women just like her. So today, we're going to go back, we're going to put together, take apart, and celebrate some information about a person we just learned about. Okay?
Welcome, Linda Tiener from Project Excel to come and tell us about your organization. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you again. It's Excel time. Uh, I'm Linda Tiener. I'm the retired director at UFM Community Learning Center, but I continue as the director for Project Excel. It's a passion that I have had since we created the program uh, 12 years ago. A project education to adults with, with developmental disabilities. Uh, we meet in the K-State Student Union to give them a K-State-like experience. We meet 10 weeks in the fall and 10 weeks in the spring. And then at the end of the year, we do a graduation each year to celebrate the uh, participation in the program and to let our students share with the audience that comes the things that they've learned in Excel during the year. We have students that come from uh, Junction City average about 70 students every week uh, that come. Uh, it's an exciting, I know, it's exciting and fun to participate in the program because the students that are there really want to be there. They're passionate about coming, about learning, about being with other people. Uh, and many of them have no other opportunities uh, than what we do with them on Saturday mornings. Um, our program uses volunteers to help with the, with the needs of the students. Uh, we use instru instructors that we pay a little bit, but they come from the community or the K-State campus uh, to offer something that they know to the community. This, this next session, which starts at the end of the month, we have uh, American Sign Language, we have an art class, we have uh, drama using puppets, which the students will create. We have a class on uh, solving mysteries and puzzles together. We have a dance class, which is always popular because they like to get up and move and do things. And then we have a Dungeons and Dragons class, which is the most popular class we have right now. Uh, we have an a, actually a professional Dungeons and Dragons instructor, who knew, um, that teaches that class for us. And I, this semester, I've had to tell those that come regularly, they may not get in Dungeons and Dragons because we've had a lot of complaints from other students who would like to take the class, but can't because there's a limit of how many can participate. Uh, so we're always looking for volunteers, either to teach or to come and help. And I'd welcome you to come anytime we're having class uh, to just participate and see uh, the excitement of the students that are there. I would also invite you to come to graduation, which I believe is May 6th this year. It'll be at 930 in Forum Hall at the K-State Student Union. Uh, and come and watch us as we celebrate the students that participated this year. I so much appreciate the um, offerings that you have given us both in emotional and monetary support. The program functions on a very and then everything else comes from grants and donations. So your contribution makes a huge difference and can actually fund three teachers most years. You've given us enough to fund three teachers. Uh, to participate in the program. So thank you so much for that. I'd be glad to visit with you after the program. Uh, you can reach me at UFM anytime. Uh, so come, give it a shot, and uh, thanks for supporting UFM and Project Excel. Yeah, how about a round of applause for that career work and the organization? So our uh, donations in the offering basket and online during the Sunday service. All this month go all to Project Excel. 
You can put your donation in the basket in the back. You can go to uufm.net slash donate. I'd also like to invite you to use this time to share your joys and sorrows from the week. You can write on the papers that are near you or there's some on the back table, your sorrows and joys. Um, and I will come around and pick them up to read them. If you're here on Zoom, you can put them in the chat box and Kathy Swenson will read them. And now we will hear Remember by Florian Christie, performed by Renee Brown.
So we have a joy from Mark Mayfield. Um, my daughter Helen, who is a sophomore at Lewis and Clark College, is um, leaving for a semester in France. So this is a joy, but a little scary for the parents. Thank you for sharing. Sending her, sending our blessings with her. And Kathy Swanson is with us on Zoom. Uh, do you have some uh, joys and sorrows from our community there? I can't hear you just yet if you're yeah. speaking. Um, we we've had uh, now we can hear you. Yeah, we've had some um, di un disconnection issues during this time, but it's kind of smoothed out. So if I seem a little shaken, it's because I'm trying to figure things out. But yes, um, we do have some a joy and, and concern from Emily Frazier. Tomorrow, uh, she's uh, going in for a minimal, minimally invasive lumbar micro um, this discretion uh, tomorrow and I should have her pronounce that uh, tomorrow morning and and she's hoping this will help a lot and it might not solve everything but it'll get her on the right road towards um, recovery from her back problems that have laid her out for so long and so we're happy for her that that's happening and and can, and hopeful hopeful that it will uh, continue now I don't know if you see my face now but somehow I'm on the chat and I'll continue from here. But um, uh, it, so we have uh, a concern uh, for the fellowship that Tom Phillips is retiring uh, from his um, uh, post or his work, but he's done such great work on the um, uh, uh, breakfast on Friday, the Happy Kitchen breakfast, and it would be That's right. we need to find some replacements because we've had Tom Phillips and Rob Delon who is leaving. So that's a concern for the fellowship. And um, also we have um, uh, some good uh, things too. I don't know if I'm, I'm to go on with some really good news as well. Um, we have uh, good news from Harmony. Uh, she is uh, in her community in Texas that her community rallied around her to help her move her RV home over onto, her, on, onto the lot so that it would better conform to the codes. But it, and it was chaotic, but with so many directing, but in the end it was done beautifully and precisely and she can settle down now. And Catherine Hedge and Katie just both said, as we all do, that the beautiful piece that was played by Renee was a joy. Uh, and uh, Katie Kingerich Page says, congratulations to Helen uh, and sending Emily good energy. So I think I have everything. If I didn't, somebody can unmute and correct me. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for holding space for our community on Zoom. And Emily, really glad to hear about uh, at long last your procedure coming up. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody who shared. Um, we have one uh, sorrow here in the sanctuary, Jean. Um, share. He writes, respect. And I want to share um, my, uh, my sorrow this morning, catching up on the news, um, hearing about the people of Jackson, Mississippi, who are entering their third week of extreme water shortage, the third in two years. This is here, here in our country, the result of infrastructure mismanagement. So holding, holding all of the news of our community near and far, um, the joys and sorrows that remain silent in our heart. 
I have a reading from the Reverend Dr. Uh, Howard Thurman, and then we'll go into some silence after that. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. Despite the dullness and barrenness of the days that pass, if I search with due diligence, I can always find a deposit left by some former radiance. But I had forgotten. At the time, it was full orbed, glorious and resplendent. I was sure that I would never forget. I had forgotten how easy it is to forget. There was no intent to betray. My response was whole, clean, authentic, but little by little there crept into my life the dust and grit of the journey. Details, lower level demands, all kinds of cross currents. Nothing momentous, nothing overwhelming, nothing flagrant, just wear and tear. If there had been some direct challenge, a clear cut issue, I would have fought it to the end and beyond. In the quietness of this place, surrounded by the or in foul, in good times or in tempests, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless or familiar. I may not forget that to which my life is committed. So let us hold a moment of silence to honor our commitments and all that resides within our hearts. So now I invite you to rise in body or spirit. Let's send some energy to our Zoom friends, send them our connectivity, and we will be singing Where My Free Spirit Onward Leads.
I think it's been about three years since our annual practice of remembering friends, relatives, and public persons whose death had occurred in the previous 12 months. Perhaps COVID's disruption of the fellowship's practice, practices and our own concern that we might be a subject of the event got in the way of the tradition. I'm pleased that we are moving back toward normal. My person whose life ended this year is Herman Daly. Arguably, he was the dean of economists committed to matching discipline and mine, his discipline and mine, to saving the planet. Born in 1938, Daly's early contributions appeared in highly prominent, well-read journals where he laid out arguments against the value of economic growth, against the value of economic growth on several accounts. Parenthetically, it should be noted that or Jessica Reagan. book, City State Economics, The Economics of Biophysical Equilibrium and Moral Growth. Was a huge success among so many, entirely too many did not accept or teach their students what Daly had so beautifully offered. Here's a summer, summer of, sample of some of the full to sensible inter, efforts to save the planet. Wendell Berry, Barry Kamena, Rene Dubose, Paul McCracken, E.F. Schumacher, Richard Heinemann, Heinberg, Wes Jackson, William Nordhaus, and Robert Rodale. And I must include our good friend, Stan Cox, the economic, or the resident economist at the Land Institute in Salina, who's spoken here and uh, who will speak for just a nickel anytime you want to hear him talk. He loves it and he's good at it and he's a great representative of the work of, uh, of a work woman, of Herman Daly. I want to close with a confession. When my master's in economics at the University of Nebraska in with I finished my uh, that economics at, at University of Nebraska in 1969. I took a job as the economics instructor at Kansas Wesleyan in Salina. There I first met the unforgettable Wes Jackson, who was in charge of the school's e environmental program. Getting to know him was an interesting and lifelong rewarding experience, which he has shared with us on several occasions. Unfortunately, Wes left a year after I landed at the school and another young professor was named as his successor. It turned out that he didn't do a very good job. So the president asked me to take over the program. I had relatively little training for the job. Remember the Latin expression, inter caicus rex unaculus, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed is king. <laughs> I found a textbook in economics and ecology, uh, and I taught a course in the subject. My students and I founded a program to collect newspapers, which we loaded on a rental truck. A student or two accompanied me twice a month to Hutchinson, where a, a recycling program paid us for our load. I enjoyed getting to know several bright students. The last project I fought mo remember most family, which was spread over two years, including convincing the city council, Salinas City Council to support for and pay for planting trees in the island of a long boulevard that had grass, telephone off wires and nothing else. The best part of that project 
was recruiting a matered, a mature city parks employee to teach a bunch of Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and 4-H kids how to plant a tree. It was really good. Every time since then, I haven't planted a tree with hoping I was doing it, without hoping I was doing it right. Thank you. Next, oh, next we have, we have several people here. Uh, Susan Adamchak is here by virtue of the miracles of modern communication. I guess. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Today I'd like to talk with you about Madeleine Albright. Madeleine Albright, the 64th Secretary of State of the United States and the first woman to hold this cabinet position, died on March 23rd, 2022, at age 84. Her achievements were a culmination of family privilege and strife, a keen mind, expansive intellect, discipline, wit, engagement, and professional and political connections. Marie Anna Korbelova was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia on May 15, 1937, to Joseph and Anna Korbelova. Her father served as a press attache in the government of Edvard Benes. The family twice fled their homeland, first when the Nazis invaded in 1939, and again when the Czech communists overthrew the government in 1948. The Corbell settled in Denver, where Yosef taught at the University of Denver, eventually becoming Dean of the School of International Relations. It was during the family's time in exile that Madeline's parents converted from Judaism to Catholicism. She was unaware of her family's Jewish origin and the deaths of nearly two dozen family members in the Holocaust for decades. Days after graduating from Wellesley College in 1959 with a degree in political science, Madeline married Joseph Albright, a wealthy newspaper heir, and the couple soon began a family. When Albright's twin daughters were born prematurely and were hospitalized for two months, she distracted herself by learning Russian as she stayed at their bedsides. She earned a master's degree and then in 1976, a doctoral degree in public law and government at Columbia University, where she studied under Zbigniew Brzezinski, a fellow refugee from Eastern Europe. From 1976 to 78, she worked as a legislative assistant to Senator Ed Muskie. In 78, Brzezinski recruited her to serve as a congressional liaison for Pre Pre President Jimmy Carter's National Security Council. In 1980, she went to the Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, where she studied the new politics of Eastern Europe. And it was at this time she also joined the faculty of Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. In 1981, when her marriage ended, Albright threw herself into the academic, political, social, and fundraising worlds in Washington. She worked as a foreign policy advisor on the election campaigns of Geraldine Ferraro, the Democratic candidate for vice president in 1984, and Michael Dukakis, the presidential candidate in 1988. While working for Dukakis, Dr. Albright met Bill Clinton, then governor of Arkansas, with national political ambitions. When Clinton was elected president in 92, Dr. Albright ran his National Security Council transition team and was soon named ambassador to the United Nations, where she served from 1993 to 97. While at the universe, at the United Nations, and later at the State Department, Dr. Albright argued for United States involvement in what she called assertive multilateralism. She lobbied, not always successfully, for strong multinational responses to thwart a new generation of tyrants, from Haiti to Rwanda to the Balkans. Dr. Albright's diplomatic efforts, both at the UN and as Secretary of State, bore mixed results. She clashed with the White House on the scope and scale of intervention in Bosnia following the breakup of Yugoslavia in the early 1980s. Following the disastrous US efforts to stabilize Somalia in 1993, her pleas the next year to intervene in Rwanda to stop the mass slaughter of ethnic Tutsis was ignored among White House staff. Both she and President Clinton 
later expressed regret for their slow response. Dr. Albright saw a stable Europe as central to U.S. interests and was convinced that Warsaw Pact countries should be aligned with the West to cement democratic gains achieved since the fall of the Berlin Wall. After six years of diplomacy, Dr. Albright helped persuade Russia and the U.S. Senate to allow Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic to join NATO. According to some analysts, this may have been her greatest diplomatic achievement and its importance may yet play out against the backdrop of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In meetings with foreign diplomats, she was firm but flexible, prepared to move beyond talking points and to engage her counterparts in frank bargaining. She was admired for her practicality, versatility, and flair. She was multilingual, speaking Czech, Polish, Russian, and French, enabling her to engage more intimately in diplomatic relations. You may recall that Dr. Albright was also known for conveying diplomatic me messages through her accessories, most noticeably the dramatic brooches she often wore on her left shoulder. After Saddam Hussein of Iraq called her a viper, she famously wore a serpent pin at the United Nations. She would signal a serious day by wearing a spider or a bee or a bug. Good days were marked by flowers, balloons, or the sun. Playing off a famous quote of George H.W. Bush to read my lips, she would tell people, read my pins. <laughs> After leaving government in 2001, Dr. Albright became chair of the Albright Stonebridge Group, a business and risk management consulting firm. She returned to teaching at Georgetown, only stepping back from teaching in the spring semester last year when her health deteriorated. In 2012, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama, the country's highest honor for civilians. Survivors include three daughters, Anne, Alice, and Katie, a sister, a brother, and six grandchildren. Finally, in an opinion piece published days after her death, Dr. Albright commented on the significance of resilience in our lives. She wrote, to me, resilience of spirit, far more than brilliance of intellect, is the essential ingredient of a full life. No matter how smart we are, we can allow sorrows and grievances to overwhelm us, or we can respond positively to setbacks, be they caused by our own misjudgments or by forces beyond our control. Clearly, our future leaders will have to be gutsy and resourceful, and so, each in our own way, will we. There is no shortage of worthwhile work to be done and no surplus of seasons in which to achieve our goals. So let us buckle our boots, grab a cane if we need one, and march. Madeline Albright, you are a star. My contribution today is to note the passing of David McCullough, uh, a well-known historian and author, and I would add my own uh, label to him as a public intellectual because he was ubiquitous in appearing in all types of media over his uh, productive life. McCullough is probably best known for his two Pulitzer Prize presidential biographies, Truman, in I mean Harry S. Truman in 1992, and John Adams, which I have my own personal copy here. Uh, he was also received um, National Book Awards for The Path Between the Seas, the creation of the Panama Canal, and Mornings on Horseback, the story of the young Theodore Roosevelt. Other notable historical works were The Great Bridge, it's about the Brooklyn Bridge, which I have read, the Johnstown Flood, which I have also read, Greater Journey, the Wright Brothers in 2015, and I note the publication dates for obvious reasons, the American Spirit in 2017, 
and his most recent, uh, the, Amer the heroic stories of the settlers who brought the American ideal West in 2019. Uh, his death at 89 shows that he was active almost to the, to the very end. He was considered a literary master, adept with literary drama, bringing momentous historical events into life using small details and testimony of individual witnesses. As he wrote, he attended, intended to put himself into the place of the particular subject. Um, put, he put himself into a spell. For example, in the 10 years that it took him to write Truman, he adopted Truman's practice of morning walks before he began writing each day. In the case of uh, Brooklyn, relating that of Washington Roebling, uh, the person responded. host narrating the PBS series Eddie Skull and Bones. It was inspired by an English faculty that included Robert Penn Warren, John O'Hara, John Hershey, and Thornton Wilder. When he graduated in 1955 with honors in literature, he gave some thought to writing fiction, and he also considered going to medical school, but did neither. He became a trainee at Sports Illustrated. Well, he was there a number of years before moving on to as a writer and editor at the United States Information Agency and the history magazine, American Heritage, these jobs, these latter jobs, allowed him to begin working nights and to begin working on his own writing. His first book was The Johnstown Flood in 1968, uh, 13 years after he graduated from college. Uh, and reviews and sales were so good that he was able to quit his day job and begin writing full time. Well, in the meantime, he had acquired a wife and had fathered five children. Fortunately, his uh, wife became an editor and a uh, uh, research assistant, uh, helping him uh, in his work. McCullough was held up as an example of, of solid values throughout his career. He received 40, that's four zero, honorary doctorates, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and numerous other awards. When he spoke in, in 2003, it was as the prestigious Jefferson Lecture, sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, at that time, the, the director of NEH was Lynn Cheney, uh, who, as you know, was the wife of Dick Cheney, uh, so much for nepotism, and uh, the mother of Liz Cheney, who we all know today. Well, I won't say any more about our own interactions, my own interactions with NEH at that time, but the K-State Library did receive a $1 million uh, challenge grant from NEH at that time. And I have some experiences about dealing with Lynn Cheney. Anyway, he dwelt upon our founders, our founding fathers, notion of the pursuit of happiness. He said, this does not mean long vacations, material possessions, or a life of ease. It means education, a love of learning, and the freedom to think for oneself. He said, I, am think, I think of writing history as an art form. I am striving to write a book that might qualify as literature, I don't want it to just be readable or interesting. I want it to be something that moves the reader. The reward of his work has always been uh, the work itself. He said, the days are never long enough, and I've kept the most interesting company throughout my lifetime. 
Just so we don't think that writing was easy for him, he certainly did not follow a particular format, which we refer to as pot boilers. And, but consider his, his, his output over a lifetime of 60 to 70 years. As I said before, the Truman book took 10 years. The Adams book took seven years. And the Truman book was on the New York Times uh, bestseller list for 43 weeks. Now I have struggled with John Adams uh, throughout the last 20 years. Um, I think if it took him seven years to write, I think it's, I tried to read it seven times. <laughs> and uh, I finally succeeded after uh, absorbing other reading uh, books of his, like the Johnstown Flood, the, the Brooklyn Bridge, and 1776, which I recommend to you if you want just a, an easy read. Uh, but anyway, his books are filled with content, and it's a joy to read each one. Well, John, uh, Evan, David McCullough surely warned me about mixing up John McCullough with David McCullough. Uh, John McCullough being a local historian, uh, who's a good friend. Um, Bruno Latour was a French philosopher whose ideas are easier to misrepresent than to explain. So here's what he did not say. <laughs> he did not deny the existence of objective truth. He was not anti-science. He did not say that the validity of a fact was affected by how that fact was generated. Right-wing extremists have distorted Latour's ideas in order to justify science denialism and conspiracy theory, just as they have misrepresented critical race theory to justify censorship in the classroom. Latour became aware of this in recent years and was horrified to be so mischaracterized for such nefarious purposes, especially because as a tease and a provocateur, as well as a, a serious philosopher, uh, he had in the past enjoyed poking fun at the scientific establishment. He once remarked that the ancient Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II could not have died of tuberculosis as scientists had claimed because the tuberculosis bacterium wasn't even discovered till 1882. <laughs> what Latour's philosophy is, is an exploration of the conditions and mechanisms by which scientific truth comes to be known. He said that our perception of reality cannot be separated from social context. Objective truth is generated and deployed only within a network of people, ideas, facilities, techniques, and equipment. Scientific facts emerge out of the mess messy push and pull of laboratory debate, imperfect experiments, incomplete results, and may or may not be widely accepted. Latour would say not that a fact was discovered or revealed. He would say a fact was produced or generated or constructed by a system or a network, and that the sophistication and well-orderedness of that system determines the robustness of the truths that emerge. This line of thinking does not deny the role of logic and reason, but it acknowledges that paths to truth are complex and imperfect, and that the understanding of reality that science achieves is typically incomplete. Latour once ran a, a unique and rather bizarre study what you might call an anthropological field study of the culture of science, conducted on site at the Salk Institute, inside the laboratory of Nobel Prize winning endocrinologist Roger Gilliman, treating the team of scientists almost as they would a primitive them around in the laboratory, taking notes on their activities and conversations, acting like Jane Goodall embedded with a troop of chimpanzees. His conclusions about the process of science were somewhat critical, and some scientists reported that Latour's ignorance of scientific and methodological details and complex instrumentation, which to him were just mysterious black boxes, clouded his judgment. But there are important implications that emerge from his ideas on the process of arriving at truth. 
for example, recognizing the value of interactive classroom discussion uh, as a format for science instruction, debunking false binaries of primitive versus civilized societies, confronting our biases regarding human versus non-human biological sophistication, recognizing the value of holistic versus compartmentalized medicine, or convincing climate skeptics of the immediate, of the imminent risk of global climate disruption. Latour's ideas on the constructed nature of knowledge have been criticized for unwittingly fueling a pernicious relativism that cynical conservatives were only too happy to exploit. But Latour believed that demystifying and humanizing the process of science would help scientists communicate with the skeptical public. Latour recently published a book entitled Down to Earth, in which he argues that facts remain robust only when they are supported by a common culture, by institutions that can be trusted, by a more or less decent public life, by more or less reliable media. With the rise of alternative facts, it has become clear that whether or not a statement is believed depends less on its veracity than on the conditions of its construction. That is, who is making it, to whom it's being addressed, and for which institutions it emerges and is made visible. A greater understanding of the circumstances out of which misinformation arises and the communities in which it takes root, Latour contends, will better equip us to combat it. Well, that just barely scratches the surface of what can and should be said about Bruno Latour, but I'm gonna close with an observation about our own Inez Alsop, longtime UUFM member, a history professor and namesake of the, the Alsop room on the other side of the building, who has never been properly credited with being an in, uh, early influence on Latour's philosophy. She foreshadowed his exploration of the idea that scientific truth is manufactured rather than pre-existing when she wrote the following. My grandma died at 94. She ate much fat and eggs galore, was healthy, strong, thought life a ball. She did not get cholesterol. Eat lots of eggs, they used to say. Folks often ate them twice a day. Cholesterol, they could not get. They had not been discovered yet. <laughs> he took me in, and when I got older, he taught me how to throw a ball and ride my bike. He also instilled his love of sci-fi in me. We would watch Lost in Space and Star Trek reruns together. Because of these experiences in my formative years, I didn't realize until I was older how amazing and beneficial it was for me to see a cast of diverse people such as Star Trek showed. Nichelle Nichols broke a major race and gender barrier when she was cast as Lieutenant Uhura on the original Star Trek series, which ran from 1966 to 1969. She is popularly cited for having the first interracial kiss on American TV with white leading man William Shatner, um, who played Captain Kirk. I don't think that even registered in my young brain, other than probably thinking the kissing was gross. What I do remember about Lieutenant Uhura was seeing a woman wield a leadership role on the bridge of the ship. She even took command of the bridge at least once. Other than the kissing incident, Uhura was respected by her male colleagues and treated as an equal. After the first year of Star Trek, Nichols was thinking of leaving the show, but Martin Luther King Jr. told her what a profound impact she was having on the black community and the civil rights movement. She was representing a strong black woman on a popular television show. As Ms. Nichols recalled, he said to her, for the first time on television, we will be seen as we should be seen every day, as intelligent, quality, beautiful people who can sing, dance, and can go to space, who are professors, lawyers. If you leave, that door can be closed because your role is not a black role and it is not a female role. He can fill it with anybody, even an alien. So she stayed on the show until it was canceled then returned for the many subsequent movies with her character gaining rank from a lieutenant to a commander. But arguably the biggest impact 
Michelle Nichols had on society is one that wasn't well known publicly until recently. In 1977, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, asked her to help recruit more women and minorities to the space program. The following year's class of astronaut candidates was the first to include women and members of minority groups. She was responsible for discovering Sally Ride and Judith Resnick, the first and second American women in space, as well as Guillaume Bluford Jr. and Ron McNair, the first and second black astronauts in space, and Ellison Onizuka, the first Asian American in space. Her efforts were instrumental in boosting NASA's female astronaut candidates from 100 to 1,649 and minority recruits from 35 to more than 1,000. In 2012, Nichols was the keynote speaker at the Goddard Space Center celebration of African American History Month. Afterward, a NASA news release stated, quote, Nichols's role as one of television's first black characters to be more than just a stereotype and one of the first women in a position of authority, she was fourth in command on the Enterprise, inspired thousands of applications from women and minorities, the release said. Among them, Ronald McNair, Frederick Gregory, Judith Resnick, the first American woman in space, Sally Ride, and current NASA Administrator, Charlie Bolden. Nichols was born in Robbins, Illinois on December 28, 1932, and was named Grace Dell Nichols. When she was 13 or 14, she asked her mother for a different first name because she didn't like being called Gracie. Her mother liked the name Michelle, but recommended Nichelle as an alliteration with her last name. Nichols was a ballet dancer and a singer, and she had dreams of being the first major African-American ballet dancer in a national ballet company. When she was in high school, she landed her first professional singing gig at a Chicago night spot. Duke Ellington saw her and hired her to tour with his orchestra. Nichols also performed in musical theater. Nichols enjoyed decades in the spotlight thanks to her screen work, her music career, and her activism to help more women and minorities succeed in the field of astronomy. Nichelle Nichols died Saturday, July 30th at the age of 89. Thank you to so all of our speakers. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for your research and your selection of, of really interesting people. And I hope that we'll keep talking about them as the afternoon goes on. For now, let's rise in body and spirit and sing Earth is our homeland, which feels appropriate uh, coming back from space. <laughs> <laughs> 